brought my friend in, Timothy Craig, into the studio this morning. And he, one thing that shocks me about Mr. Timothy that I find very admirable is that he has been using a, a dumb phone since he first got a phone. Uh, but good morning to you, Mr. Timothy. Good morning, Mr. Adrian. Praise be to God. It's good to have yes, you on. Sir. Thank you. Good to be on. Yes, praise be to God. Now, uh, tell me about yourself a little bit before we get started. Yeah. Uh, for people who don't know um, your your little your background, your because you went to which many people don't even never even heard of this. You went to a pre seminary, but before you went to pre seminary, you were like nine different kinds of Protestant. Uh, so <laughs> tell me the the, the two minute version of your story. Yeah. So I mean. My parents, my mom was cradle Catholic, my dad was Protestant, they both kind of fell away, then came back into the faith, so I was raised very Protestant, and very strong, very traditional Protestant, uh, no technology, growing up we had no TV, my parents didn't have phones, I mean this was uh, right when phones were becoming popular, um, eventually we, we were all sorts of stuff, we were, uh, we were Baptist, we were Nazarene, we were Messianic Jewish, we were Mennonite, and my dad was just kind of looking for the the true, the one and only true church that taught the truth. And finally ran into St. Ignatius of Antioch, ran into Scott Hahn, and uh, was like, oh, maybe that's the Catholic Church. And after a long and hard struggle, finally my whole family came into the church uh, Easter Sunday back in 2011. So ever since then, of course, we've been Catholic, thanks be to God. Um, and shortly afterwards, actually through Catholic Radio, I heard about they someone did a show where they talked about an older thing that they used to do called minor seminaries or high school seminaries, where if you wanted to become a priest and you were a teenager in high school, you could go and start your training early. Um, so I was like, I wanted to become a priest at the time, and I was like, that sounds pretty cool. Let me see if these things still exist. Looked into it, found one up in Minnesota, uh, Mankato, Minnesota, and a uh, little seminary, St. Jose Sanchez del Rio. Uh, minor seminary run by the Institute of the Incarnate Word. Decided to go check it out. We did. Uh, decided to attend. And I went for about two and a half years. And it was uh, phenomenal. I, I never grew so much in my entire life. Uh, the, especially one of the priests there, Father Mariano Var Varela, was phenomenal in my own spiritual growth, my own love of Our Lady. Um, he was the one who really helped me overcome a lot of my Protestant upbringing as far as aversion to Our Lady and... Uh, aversion to tradition and many of those things. Um, so phenomenal priest. Uh, I, I'm very grateful to him. Uh, after I left seminary for various complicated reasons, I came home, continued discerning a little bit, uh, met a young lady who is now my wife. We, uh, we decided to begin courting after a while. We uh, courted for about a year, uh, got engaged, got married, and now we have one son, uh, one son, uh, also named Timothy, and a little girl on the way. So we're very, very excited. We've been married for about two years now, and uh, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that's praise uh, be to God. Yeah, that's the long and short of it. And yeah. the crazy thing to most people, and to to me too, I'm like, I don't know how you function, is your family doesn't have a computer or internet. You don't have internet. No, no. You don't have a TV. Um, you have a dumb phone. Um, how on earth do you function? Yeah, I mean, it does make things every now and then a little inconvenient. I will say that. Um, I know my boss recently was wanting me to take some classes for my mechanic job uh, so I could, you know, up my knowledge. And I had to tell him, like, yeah, okay, okay, but I can only do it in the evenings at the library. So I can't just get on my, my computer at home and, uh, and get on the internet. Yeah, we don't have a computer. We don't have TV. Uh, when we do want to watch movies, we have a small projector that we set up and all that. So we got to get a CD from the library. Very uh, old fashioned, I guess now. But uh, as far as emailing goes, my wife does have a smartphone. Um, she uses it a lot for looking up recipes. And then, I mean, one of the biggest things I think that is incredibly difficult is with the ever changing road landscape of Houston, you need a GPS. So. My wife has that smartphone that does have a GPS that I will take to if I'm heading off across town. I have no idea where to go. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with Houston. I've grown up here my whole life. But if I need a GPS, I'll take my wife's phone. She has a GPS so she doesn't get lost. Um, and if I need to send an email, I probably won't get back to you anytime soon. But I will eventually get back to you. Uh, usually, uh, I can confirm he's yes. really bad at responding. I am terrible at responding, <laughs> but I, I make it a point to be terrible at responding because I, I am bugged by nowadays people are so quick to respond. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, they, in a, in a way, that's good. I enjoy the convenience, and I think that you know a lot of people desire that. But I also, I think it's harmful the demand of your attention, that everyone is constantly demanding that. I mean, you you should be at their beck and call. Yeah. Um, whether it be work, whether it be friends, whether it be uh, even to an extent family. I mean, if it's an emergency, okay, that, that's understandable. But whenever I have you know friends and family and uh, especially work that's wanting me to respond right here and right now. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm off of work. Mm. I'm spending time with my family. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to respond right yeah. this moment. Uh, and things like that. Uh, so, Timothy, how is how does that go with, like, your organizing things and switching phones to your wife? How does that, how does that work out? I mean, overall, I think it works pretty good. As long as you communicate well. Um, I mean, most of the times we're, we're pretty – we're pretty on the pretty much on the same page. We we know what each other are doing. We know what our plans are, um, and it, it helps sometimes actually in that I'll get a text from a friend and I'll completely forget to reply. And my wife is you know she's got my phone that day and she's like, oh you never responded to this guy. Oh yeah, I never did. <laughs> and sometimes it's like oh I, I don't really want to respond to that guy. <laughs> she's like okay, um, so she helps me get over that sometimes too. Um, but overall, I mean I think it's it's very good, very healthy. I mean she. she she knows who my friends are. She knows what we talk about. Uh, she's not always very fond of it sometimes. You know, she, you know, she, she and some of my friends have some mixed relationships. But uh, uh, overall, I mean, we're, we're just very much on the same page. I think it helps us to really just, uh, you know, really trust each other, really be on the same page. We know what we're doing. We know, uh, we know what the plan is. Um, I, I don't know. It's, it's good because, you know, whenever I message you or talk to you, I always think, Oh yeah, I mean, whatever I say to Timothy, his wife's gonna know. Yeah, and yeah. so it's very, it's very, and it's, I think that's very healthy. Oh, and yeah. It's very good that there's a a trust there that you're not trying to hide something from your wife, and yeah. she's not, and and she's not trying to hide something from you. You'll be able to find out pretty easily. Oh yeah, uh, very quickly if there if that was the case. And I think that's very that's a very healthy thing. Yeah. No, I mean it's it's one of those things where I, I mean, my wife and I don't agree on everything. Like we have quite a few topics actually that are kind of hot button topics that we struggle with and some of my friends are more one way or the other way and some of her friends are very much against me in these regards and it's one of those things where I think it also helps us to just kind of not foster that sort of you know oh I go to my friends and I complain about my wife and I'm constantly complaining you know she, she knows you know we, we're very open about these topics she knows what my friends think I know what her friends think um, and we, we're very open you know oh well my friend said this today you know well, let's talk about this like you know we, we're very we're able to talk through a lot of these harder discussions harder topics and we disagree a lot of times but mm-hmm. we're able to trust each other and work through things a lot easier when we're not hiding a lot of our thoughts and our feelings on these matters now Timothy you talk as if you are living during the, the greatest generation the <laughs> 19, 1920s uh, relationship with your wife uh, the your your aversion to to technology of going to the library to check out a movie. Um, you sound like you are from the a century gone by. So how old are you, and how did you end up coming up with this idea to try to not have this technology around your kids, and why? Yeah, so I'm I'm fairly young, I guess, for most people who are married my age. I'm only 21 currently, so I'll be 22 in January. But I've been married for about two years. So I was married when I was 19. My wife was 18, so pretty young. Um, but I, it's something that I really saw a distinct change in my family because I grew up traditionalist Protestant, uh, no technology. We we're Mennonite for a while, so very, very strict. And I was bored out of my brain because I had didn't have TV, didn't have shows. So I read all the time. That's partially what allowed me to really discover the faith as I developed this love of reading. Um, and I saw tremendous benefits from the way my family lived. Um, and growing up, I saw other circumstances where it's not always terrible. There are families who do it. It's possible. But I, I still think the easiest way, and not only that, but I think the most secure and in the end, what's going to get you the furthest is if you just cut it out altogether. If you, I mean, I, I like movies as well. Every now and then we'll watch a good movie. But if you, all you can do is read books. That's all you'll do is you'll read books. And if you have good books you provide for your children, they'll read books. Um, so seeing their example, seeing, and I, granted, when I was younger, I hated it too. I was like, why can't we be like the other kids? You know, I wanted to play video games. I would go to my friend's houses and I'd, you know, it was, it was something that was a source of friction. But looking back, I'm very grateful for the way my parents raised me. And it's something I, I want to give my kids. I think it's difficult. 
and sometimes can be a source of friction, especially living in the world. We don't live in the world where the kids, the other kids are going to be like that anymore, even among good traditional Catholic circles. Um, but I think it's important to realize and to teach your kids, like, no, like, this is how we're going to live because we're going to focus on what is most important, on bettering ourselves spiritually, on bettering ourselves educationally, reading good, solid books, uh, going and playing outside. Kids don't do that anymore. My little brothers don't do, do that as much anymore. Uh, that's something that I really think is just lost and because of the technology. That's something I wanted to ensure that my kids had was that they read books, they went outside, and they had a normal, good childhood where they were raised to be good, strong Catholic men and women um, and good feminine women. Um, I grew up mostly with brothers, so I, I'm, I'm raising girls. <laughs> hey, how many brothers do you have? I got seven brothers. Seven so brothers. Eight and boys total, and I got three younger sisters. So three younger up, sisters. It was seven boys all at once, and then three girls at the end. So mm. I, I raised the boy, or I helped raise the boys. Uh, girls are new things. I'm having a little daughter this April, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> That'll be fascinating. I, by the time uh, my little sisters were born, I was off at seminary also with all boys. So hmm. it'll, be, it'll be fascinating. But uh, it'll be great. Well, praise be to God. I think that's really awesome. Uh, we have just about, uh, about six minutes left in our conversation, and I wanted to kind of shift the conversation over to talking about your Anglophile uh, <laughs> little vice you yes, have there. Uh, <laughs> the you were telling me about Guy Fox Day, and I don't know anything. I think the only thing I know about Guy Fox is that that mask that people wear. Yeah, called the, the Vendetta guy, mask. Yeah, the, the Vendetta anonymous. mask. Yeah, that's the only thing I know about this guy. So who was Guy Fox, and, and just a, a one minute version of uh, why you're an Anglophile? Yes, so I'm an Anglophile because mainly. I, I went to the ordinary for a while, and I really uh, rediscovered, in many ways, a vibrant Catholic English history. Now, there's some Anglican stuff that we don't talk about, but uh, especially pre-Anglo Reformation, the Catholic faith in England was extraordinarily vibrant. I'm also uh, patrimonially uh, by, my, by my father's side English, so I wanted to adhere to a culture, and I one single culture, not a mix. And so I was like, I will be English, since my father was English. So. Uh, I adhere to the English culture, and I deeply love the English culture. Um, okay, so Guy Catholics. Fox. Guy Fox. Uh, Guy Fox. Guy Fox, yes. Okay. Uh, also known as Guido Fox. Uh, really? He, yes. Okay. Uh, so he was a so English— he was a, So he was Sicilian. I'll explain that. Okay. So he was a recusant uh, Protestant. His family was recusant, so it means For those that who don't know— for the, uh, They were Catholics during the reign of Elizabeth, where it was illegal to be Catholic. So they had to pay a fee if they didn't want to go to the Protestant services. So they were called recusants because they refused to give up their faith. Um— so he was raised Catholic. Eventually, he grew up. It was very hard to get a job as a Catholic. So he fled to Italy and Spain, and where he fought in the wars. And he went by the name of Guido, um, mm. so also known as Guido Fox. If you look at his confession, uh, it's signed Guido Fox. Oh wow! Um, so in in Spain and uh, uh, Italy, he was he gained a reputation as a man of incredible virtue and strength and chivalry, just a pinnacle of English knighthood. Eventually, he returned to England. And uh, there was a lot of hope uh, during the reign of King James I uh, after Elizabeth because he seemed to be less harsh against the Catholics. Um, but eventually his parliament kind of went, uh, they were like, you need to be harsher. So he began to up the persecutions, and they were like, there's no hope at this point. He is just like Elizabeth. We need to end this. So him and a few friends, they uh, made a plot to blow up parliament, uh, Protestant parliament. They decided to... Uh, go in, they disguise themselves, they built up a, a network, they went in. Um, unfortunately, they, they rented, they, they rented a, a little uh, room in the bottom of Parliament where they filled it with gunpowder. Everything was in place. Um, but unfortunately, their network grew too large, and there was a, uh, a weak link who leaked it to one of the members of Parliament. And the day of, they discovered Guido, uh, Guy Fox in the, in the basement, uh, with the match in his hand, about to blow up Parliament. Oh, wow. So uh, it almost succeeded, but unfortunately he was arrested. Uh, after weeks of torture, they finally uh, got out his confession. Uh, so he refused to give it up, but uh, at long last, I mean, e English torture at that time was very refined and very, very harsh. So he finally gave up. Uh, his other compatriots had fled, so uh, they were unfortunately... He, he was the one versed in warfare, so he... Uh, they had all the rest of the gunpowder, and they tried to dry it because they got a little damp. They're like, we need this for our guns, and it can't be damp. So they put it out in front of a fire to dry it out, blew up in their faces. Oh they went blind goodness. and were injured. 
that's whenever the soldiers finally caught up to them, they were all captured. Um, they were all sentenced to be hung, drawn, and quartered. Um, that's a very gruesome death. They cut open your bowels, gruesome. pull it they, out. They hang you till you're almost dead. Then they cut out your bowels and they cut off your arms Oof. while you're still alive. Extraordinarily painful. People like Edmund Campion suffered deaths like these. Saint Edmund Campion. Um, so he, uh, unfortunately, he did fail in the last moments, and to not suffer the death, such a gruesome death, he jumped from the gallows and broke his neck. So a sort of suicide, unfortunately. But overall, a very, very great example of English resistance. They fought to the last for the English Catholic faith. They did mm-hmm. not want to, I mean, they recognized that these Protestants were coming in, they were usurping uh, the, the Catholic faith, the right to the Catholic Church, and they were willing to do whatever was necessary, even at risk of their own life. If you, if you really think about it as well, Guy Fox had very little chance of getting out of Parliament. There was a chance. But when he hit, lit that match... It was most likely his own end as well. Wow. So very valiant, uh, and England still celebrated, uh, unfortunately, as a Protestant holiday, but especially myself as an Anglophile Catholic, uh, I celebrate it as a a celebration of a great hero of the Catholic faith who uh, truly lived and died for the church. Yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't know that, and I'd be very curious to see, kind of do an analysis maybe later, uh, maybe during the after show, if you'll stay with us, we could talk about... um, whether or not that is morally justified to blow up parliament. I think that's a very interesting question. It is an interesting topic, um, yes. So, yeah, very interesting. I mean, living in that kind of world, that kind of life, that is very, very. I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult for us to understand what it must have been like to live in Catholic England and then have England become Anglican yeah. and then have the switch being back and forth, the king uh, being pro, anti, um, <laughs> and the whole thing is incredibly complicated and Americans very much like to oversimplify situations to make oh, yes. it black and white. I did want to shift the topic a little bit and talk about, oh, let's talk about this. Guy Fox. Okay. Here's a question. I want to get y'all's take in the audience uh, for people who are watching online. I'm going to throw up a question on YouTube. I'm going to throw up a poll. Throw up a poll. Is it okay to assassinate people? Okay, let me rephrase that. Is it everly morally permissible to assassinate someone? Because I'm thinking, okay, like for a long time, it was not considered okay to use bows um, because it was considered cowardly. You were not fighting; you were shooting someone from a distance. And then, whenever the uh, crossbow came out, is even worse. And then, when the gun came out, it was like, oh my goodness! Imagine just like you shooting somebody like that—that's crazy. And then you get to modern warfare, and you get bombings of people and so you could just like you're flying overhead and all of a sudden you're wiped out didn't even know there was anything over your head um so the question is is it ever okay to assassinate somebody and if it is okay what are the circumstances in which it's okay um so that's the question grappling catholic says my roommate heard that from the other room and shouts absolutely (laughs) (laughs) there we go Uh, all right i will save my opinions for last um We'll start with let's start with you, Rudy. Is it morally permissible to assassinate someone? Um, okay, so we have to look at it from a just war perspective. If we're in a, a situation where the if we're in a situation where innocent lives may be destroyed on account of this one person, I would say that it is morally permissible to assassinate that person. Okay. That's simple. I will, simple ass. I will not comment on it. Um, Timothy, what is your take? I would in general agree. I would create a slight distinction in that, in that I think, and one of the reasons why Guy Fox was incredibly looked down upon by the English in general, including Catholics, was it was always considered very dishonorable to assassinate anyone. Mm. But I don't think it's quite a question of morality as much as honorability. I think as long as it lines up with the just war doctrine, to if you if you think of what the just war doctrine is, if uh, if I kill someone in this circumstance, it's I'm acting under the hand of God, uh, in His authority and the in the authority of the government, uh, in the proper government or the government that will replace the government. 
Therefore, how I kill him is not doesn't seem to me, as long as I'm not killing him through immoral means, which, you know, most assassinations aren't. You shoot him in the head or stab him, whatever. Seems to me would be dishonorable or at least less honorable. Um, but as long as it lines up with, with the just war doctrine, you're following, uh, you know, you've tried every other means, you're not killing innocents, um, all of these different things. You have a replacement government if you're killing a leader. It seems to me it would be moral, less than ideal, but depending on the circumstances, uh, permissible. So you, the follow-up question for your position Therefore, would it be permissible for Guy Fox to do it? Because it would seem that there wasn't a a need. S- well, not a need, because I mean, I could be argued that there's a need considering the oppression of the Catholic Church there. Yeah. But there wasn't a, an alternative government ready to be to take its place. I would actually mm-hmm. hear, and here's where I'd create a distinction. Okay. I I love Guy Fox. Okay. I don't think he was an incredible moral theologian or a very prudent man. I okay. think he was a courageous man. I do disagree with whether or not it was the most prudent decision, and including for the fact that there were innocents in the building who would have died. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, of course, he probably would have seen it more as, like, you know, for the greater good. There was also the, the idea was that the king's daughter would be put into the throne and that hopefully she would be able to be uh, either manipulated or just in general be more sympathetic to the Catholic cause, but there was no assurance of that. So I do think that it was a imprudent and definitely theologically uh, incorrect action. Now, how much Guy Fox was culpable for that, you know, he was not a Thomistic theologian, so I'm sure, uh, and, and, and my, in my view, it seems to me that he probably was acting uh, in the best means he knew how and under the best theology he was taught but you know being if he had been a bit more versed in Thomistic theology perhaps would not have made the same decision he did Mm -hmm. so I do think that we can point to this and say technically immoral but he is still an admirable character that I I still definitely look up to so here's my take and uh, I'll give you all the the correct answer now (laughs) I'm just kidding (laughs) Uh, (laughs) he looks at me like what was that about (laughs) i'm just trying to see your reaction to see if anybody would say anything but here's my my take i'm not saying that mine answer is the definitive answer because i'm just kind of speculating but saint thomas when asked about whether or not it was lawful for an individual to kill someone who has sinned that's a question he asked in the summa and this comes in the question of murder because he's talking commenting on thou shalt not murder right and the answer is, of course, you can kill a sinful man if it's in self-defense. Mm. So someone's attacking you and you're defending yourself. Otherwise, it would be vigilante justice. And so therefore, you can't go out of the way and usurp the power that God has given to the state. God gave to the government the legitimate power to execute and so because that has that authority, an individual does not. It would seem that this would be – assassination would be that case because it would not be warfare unless there has been somebody which a legitimate revolution against a tyrant or we would probably say a counter-revolution because the Anglicans were the revolutionaries. The counter-revolutionaries to restore the Catholic government, it would have to have been led – by somebody who has the authority. So for instance, the if if like the what is it, the Tudor line? Yes. That was the Catholic line? Uh, back then actually that was still the Stuart line. It still would have been the Stuart line. Yes. So if the Catholic um the the Catholic claimant to the throne was said, Oh, we're gonna back this and they were following their lead, well then there'd be a legitimate um "Quote unquote government declaring a war of of sorts, and so then you would have more leeway in doing something like that. Mm. Um, the fact there are innocents in the room makes it a, also bad. So, is it ever okay to assassinate somebody? I would say, I would say, yes, it would be okay only in the circumstance." 
that one, you're in a war, a just war. Two, the person being assassinated is a um, a bad guy, basically, is evil. And three, you minimize the possibility of collateral damage, yeah. um, which collateral damage is different from, like, for instance, if you blow up parliament and you made sure that there was all the innocents were away, you blew it up, and their shrapnel flies off and kills somebody that was walking on the street. That would be collateral damage. If you blow up parliament knowing that parliament is filled with innocent people at the same time, that's not collateral damage. You killed those people because it's, it's there. You didn't try to avoid them. Or if you were like there was a vehicle driving down the road and your missile striking it and you strike the missile, but then the car flips over and it hits someone else's car and that person dies. That's collateral damage. But if you have a target who's in the middle of a city and you decide to drone strike them in the middle of a city and a bunch of people die, it's not collateral damage. You kill those people. Um, so I would say yes, under very specific parameters, I would say assassinations would be okay, though cowardly. Yes, mm -hmm. I do agree with that. I think that Guido was, or Guy Fox was unfortunately wrong in his... Uh, decision to assassinate the king at this point and the House of Lords and Parliament. Um, how much he's culpable for that, I don't know. Uh, but I, I do admire him for being willing to you know, risk life and limb to resist the Catholic tyranny. Yeah. Uh, it was definitely a very, very difficult time at that period in Catholic England. So uh, how much they are fault to be faulted for this? But we can still look at it and say, yeah, that was probably wrong. But don't worry, Adrian. When you're a king... I'll take you out nice and clean. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, dude. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas, on his De Regnumi, um, he says, Thomas Aquinas, uh, let's see, da -da -da -da. those who take action against a tyrant may, fall, may, may fail in their objectives and only succeed in rousing the tyrant to greater savagery. Mm. Which it's, is actually what happened. The sense they failed, the king actually smacked harder on the Catholics. So... Mm. Um, so St. Thomas knows what he's talking St. about. St. Thomas does know what he's talking about. They should have read a little more St. Thomas, yeah. apparently. Yeah, yeah. apparently. Yeah, because he, he goes on, he says, um, and even if they do succeed, you may actually cause greater strife and discord among the populace if you don't have, like, basically everything set up mm -hmm. in place to solve the door, the cry, solve this, the, the situation, which it sounds like even if they had succeeded, that's probably what would have happened. Yeah. Because um, you said, what was her name? Queen Mary? What did it mean? Uh, not Queen Mary, but I believe her name was, is, uh, I'm not going to say her name because my memory does not serve me, but oh, it was the his daughter. daughter. It, was it was the his daughter, daughter of the king. Who um, uh, probably uh, wouldn't have been very fond of the Catholics after exactly. they killed her dad. They killed her dad, so. Yeah. yeah. So he would have just like converted her to be more anti-Catholic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, St. Thomas knows what he's talking about, typically. So let's see. Uh, where's another quote? He says, when I, wait, uh, that's not what I want to read. Let's see. Um, at a time when the, the Syrian cousins, I don't know who that is, all desired the death of Dionysius, there was an old woman who continually prayed that he would survive her. The tyrant coming to know this asked why she acted as such, and she replied, when I was yet a girl, we were oppressed by a tyrant. And I desired his death. He was slain, but was succeeded by another who opposed us even more harshly. And again, I was greatly pleased to see the end of his reign. But he is succeeded by you, who are an even harsher ruler. So I fear that if you are taken from our midst, you will be succeeded by one who is even more terrible. Uh, which is being recounted by St. Thomas in his De Regimini Principium. Mm. 